Um, I'd almost rather get taken out on a trailing stop at this point than try to pick a high. I mean, he's oh, been yeah. this is... he's been in forever in this thing. He's been in down here since uh, the one thirties. He's been along the thirty year. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, it's yeah. A, it's, you know, it's a great play. So uh, he took off. He just but... runs through. I don't, Santelli did a really nice hit today with Rogoff, who I'm not a giant fan of, but Santelli actually got him out to actually really venture for some forceful opinions. So I thought that was interesting, and there's a lot of talk about this front loading, and Rogoff says it's just stupid, which I happen to agree with, that the Treasury is front loading all this uh, debt into, t into the T bill market, uh, and it's far more than the market had originally anticipated, so uh, it is causing some some problems. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, but we do have the, uh, of course, the Fed today, and, and I've talked to a few people uh, who think this could be a possibility that you get, what you'll get today is the quarter point and an immediate end to quantitative tightening. Well, to me, if you got that, that would be almost like getting a cut of about 37 basis points. And don't ask me how to do the hard math, but um, that would be that would be interesting because I want to see the way the market would react because that's a that's a two pronged attack, almost fitting, you know, going back to what uh, when uh, uh, Powell took the initial really dovish pivot, and he said that they were going to suspend the quantitative tightening at the end of uh, September, September 30th, to be exact. But if they were to do that now, um, you know, the market uh, would take that, I think, as uh, a little bit more than the quarter point that they've baked in. Uh, of course, not quite the, the half, uh, half point that some people would like to see, but I don't think they're going to get that. But the fact that Trump has been talking more about the uh, male effects of uh, the quantitative tightening, almost like, you know, as Mnuchin was talking to, uh, to Powell. And don't forget, uh, you have to realize that it's pretty well known that it was Mnuchin who really pushed uh, Trump to, uh, to appoint Powell as Fred's chair. So if anything, that may be the, the extra uh, piece of the puzzle today. So I pay attention to that. What would the outcome would be? I think you'd get some, uh, I think on a quarter point, I, I think, well, then of course into the mix, we have July 31st, so it's month end, which we tend to see, of course, if that market want to get uh, dressed up a little bit by money managers. Um, that may make it a little bit, uh, well, certainly more volatile. So I'll tell you that, but you know, there's been all these stories these uh, studies out, you know, that the market, uh, the S&P actually drops on days when the Fed cuts rate. So we'll, we'll see. I'm, I'm really much more in all the other ancillary markets. How will the dollar act if that happens? How will the metals act? Especially because metals have had such a good month. Uh, and again, the month end here. So will that uh, see through to the end of today? Um, and uh, the, the curves, uh, if they were to announce it, uh, I think that you, you might get a little bit of steepening. Uh, but these curves may be flattening as much because of the huge uh, amount of supply coming on the front end due to the Treasury uh, uh, moving so much money, moving so much of their funding into the one year T bill, you know, one year and shorter uh, T bill market, which is. And they're doing far more than was originally anticipated. So can't take your eye off there. Okay. Yeah, there's a few people coming in from Pax's room. Uh, guys, when you come in, try to mute yourself and turn off your video. As beautiful as everybody is, it what it does is it, it – uh, when guys are looking at um, a screen, it, it, it shrinks my screen. Thanks. Okay. 
Hey, Danny. Ira, Ira, a little bit earlier today, we were talking about uh, the HFI account by by the banks. Yeah. Held for investment, and um, I, I don't I don't remember if it was Brian or Ezra, and I suggested that they ask you about it, and and what okay. role that could play in all of this. Well, when you talk about the help for investment, you're just talking about the self-sustaining, so what they invest themselves on the short end and to meet the regular requirements. Because uh, I'm not, I'm not yes. Uh, yes. familiar with yes. that term, but you know, I look at those in uh, in reserve the uh, high-quality liquid assets, H the HQLA, which is played some havoc with because of the regulatory. Situation. That's why at the end of the year you saw a massive tightening uh, for the year end, and the Fed really got caught off guard by that. So uh, again, you know, they want to do certain things, but in in terms of the uh, the regs you passed under Dodd Frank, those have a different type of impact because the banks do have to hold a higher amount of. Uh, liquid reserves than was previously done and that has kept some of them out of the funding market um, which is the dealers you know with the, the dealers have actually been blocking at the Fed because they don't have enough capacity to take on the amount of uh, T-bills that the Treasury is coming with so uh, there are concerns that this is going to be a bigger problem than people think we'll, we'll see it's just again we're, we're kind of guessing at this, but uh, let's let's get deeper into this. Uh, what do we got? So you you think the goon squad shows up today? Yeah, who, the goon squad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh boy. Oh, you know it, it, this is. Uh, you know I. Well, this is really a hard one, but again, does he see quantitative, quantitative tightening immediately? I think the market would view that as probably the most dollars to buy with a 25 basis point cut. I, I mean, there's so many opinions running out there how the market is reacting. And, uh, you know, I, I don't think that's why the S&P is up. More, more significantly, it will, be, it, will there be something coming out of the Chinese uh, negotiation right after the Powell, you know, delivers up whatever he's going to deliver up. Are they going to, are they going to come forth with a, uh, excuse me, um, are they going to come forth with a, uh, uh, a positive, something positive as far as trade? And, and, you know, because Trump set the table yesterday by being so negative, which, again, you know, I believe that he, he's using Powell to his advantage, you know, and saying, hey, I'm going to get my way one way or another, so tell me the way you want to do this. So what you're, what you're thinking is the Fed is not going to be solely data dependent they're going to be affected by politics as well. They're not data dependent. There, there's no way that if they were data dependent, we'd be talking about the possibility of a rate rise, not, not a rate cut. So, exactly. Let's, let's, yeah. <laughs> I, although, if I dig around the world and, and, uh, and if I decide that, you know, that I take what Powell did in, uh, in his Paris speech, a short speech, and what uh, Richard Clarendon did and what John Williams did, you know, I've got all kinds of things I can find around the world to justify for sure a 50 basis point cut. For sure. It, yeah, you know, I got this. You saw the data out of uh, Europe today. You got, oh, you can cite the, uh, the fears of a hard Brexit. You can, what's going on in China. You know, uh, all types of things. They're not, they're not data dependent. That's, you know what? That's one of the three great lies. I mean, that being the case, why do you suppose Draghi actually didn't make any moves and, and neither did Kuroda? They talk, but there's no action. 
Well, Corona doesn't. He's been getting away with his little action. First of all, there's no bonds for him to buy, and he already That's owns true. so much of the ETF market. So they they do this jawboning. <clears throat> Draghi doesn't really have much to buy either, under the capital key. And as I, you know, uh, oh, I don't know, did I talk to you guys? Just yeah. But there was that article in the FT about you know the German High Court again. There is a, a lot of noise, and so Draghi was a little cautious. And felt that, you know, listen, I, I still have uh, six weeks to play here, or whatever, five to six weeks. And if I need to uh, to do something uh, more drastic, I'll do it. I don't have to go now. I don't have to go now. Uh, you know, and again, I, I thought it was reprehensible that uh, Larry Fink and uh, Rick Reeder had come out and a week or a few days before that, the ECB meeting, and suggested that the ECB if they were really serious, should start buying equities. You know, I thought that was a reprehensible. And I'm not the only one. There's a lot of people who follow that uh, down the line. Um, so that, that, in effect, right. So there was no reason for Draghi to go. And there was evidently some some pushback in that meeting uh, as more stuff comes out, you know, where, you know, he could speak to consensus. But that's why he kept referring back to the Sintra speech in Portugal, which I actually reread yesterday. Um, um, as I had to pick my car up at 31st in uh, Shields. Um, so I had to take the train so I could get a little time. Um, meanwhile, the guy does great uh, detail and he brings me the car details. 31st in Shields. JJ. Johnny Patek. <laughs> oh, man, he'd be a good guy. I couldn't think of his last name, but he is. No, Paul Sanjo. <laughs> He's a good great guy. Great work. He is a good guy. And I'll tell you, great work. And he knows everybody I know. It was like a, I, I, and I thought I was on the set of Bronx Tale. You, know, you can't beat that. <laughs> <laughs> you are. You are. My cousin belongs to a club, a private club down the block. Not not the big one on the corner, but one down the street. Yeah. On the corner, yeah. And it really is like that. I have done it, and it, it's so comfortable. It really is. You know, that's a neighborhood. Good, bad, or different. That's a neighborhood. You know, because we're talking about people that we join, people that we know. And his cousin it's a, has done all the construction in my house over the last twenty years. No kidding. He says, "Yeah, T and T. He's the greatest." He says, "I said you got to know." He said, "So I know." Him. Hey, call him up. We were having a conversation, three-way conversation. <laughs> I tell you, it was, what, what did they, and it did phenomenal work because my car had all this tree sap built up over the last six years because I don't get to park in the garage. <laughs> yeah, not anymore. No, no, I, uh, I'm out. I'm, I'm, I'm the odd man. You have been for 40 years. It's like, <laughs> yeah, it was. It's a nice it's house. I, I knew what I was walking into. Um, <clears throat> um, but you, you, we have this, and there was no, there was no reason for Draghi. He, he didn't have to. He, he, he's so good at getting the most. And you saw the way the market reacted. The interesting thing was the weakness in the DAX yesterday was, you know, it was down uh, two and a half percent and almost three percent by the aftermarket in uh, response to I'm not sure the hard Brexit um, and other things. So uh, interesting, interesting the action that we're getting. That's that's all I can say. Very, very interesting. But he he's got he's got to keep some of his powder dry. Uh, and, and so will be. I I'm also watching. The, you know, if I was right that they have a, because I'm kind of thinking they may have some of the positives done, but the markets are telling me right now I'm wrong. Because I thought we were going to see a late rally in the soybeans, but they're not. They're breaking. They're going the other way. So there is no, uh, there is no secret deal. The metals are getting trashed right now too, unfortunately. So. Yeah, and the uh, and the miners have been uh, under pressure since the opening range. They've been going down. Yeah. And I, yeah, I'm, you I'm, know, not, I'm not getting out. I don't really care. You know what? This is you know month month end, or you know they're putting a lot of pressure on it. Listen, they've had a great month. A phenomenal month. So uh, it's uh, profit time, as we say. Take those profits. So you're seeing some of it, you knows because they've had such extended moves. Yeah, look, I'm looking at Newmont down a dollar. That's a heavy move. 
Uh, I know we've discussed, you know, Bungie had a big move this morning, but that was based on the per percentage, you know, they had big earnings coming off of their owning of Beyond Meat, which shows you that they're at least looking forward. So that was actually a, a pretty good uh, move for all the wrong reasons. It's not why I'm long it, so that was, uh, that was a cherry on the top. So, Ira, what, um, depending on how the market behaves today, tomorrow, what uh, what co what trades are you interested in in um, putting on? You know, what, well, what strikes your fancy? I'm going to be looking at the steepeners. If I'm right, did they end uh, huge quantitative uh, tightening? Uh, you know, I think that we should see some movement in that uh, because the market will. Uh, We'll, uh, we'll view it, I think, as, you know, a little bit more aggressive than the quarter point. Uh, so I think that that is something to watch. And then we'll see what happens with the, especially that the metals are getting whacked now, to see if they turn, if you've got a, if you've got a cut and if you've got a, um, you, and you've got a cut and you've got an end to quantitative tightening. Those are those are the two issues. So, would that extra oomph of cut of ending quantitative tightening immediately be enough to boost some of the assets that are really under pressure today? Yeah, we were looking at this rollover gap, Ira. The uh, well, they're just getting the stops in the goal right now under 3480. Yeah. And uh, so you got a rollover gap down to 22. Uh, what on this one 28? So it depends upon. You know, if you're looking at an active daily or a daily, what where it comes down to, it can come down as low as 22 and a half. Okay. Yeah. So on this chart, it, on a on the on the pit, it's 22 uh, or 22 and a half. The all session, it's 28. Okay. Uh, listen again. You, you've had substantial moves in the in the gold silver. Uh, Um, so, uh, listen, uh, I'm just going to see the way they react. And, and don't forget, you have to go get, put your charts up and look at June 19th, which was the day of the last Fed meeting, and the volatility we got off of that. So, it'll tell you exactly what could happen here. Yeah. Well, I think, I think the behavior of the European markets – since uh, the ECB last week is a pretty good uh, canary in the coal mine. Why, why do you say that? Well, they've, they've done nothing but decline yeah. since um, since uh, ECB, what was it, Thursday? Yeah, Thursday. Yeah, Thursday. Right. yeah, I mean, the DAX movement has been, but, you know, some of that, too, is anticipation. Don't forget, if, if they reach some type of... Um, uh, soft uh, agreement with the Chinese. I say soft, meaning that they'll get a headline and it won't be as much as anybody wants, but it will be something. I really look for Trump to move on on Europe. Uh, that you know whether he'll actually come through with it or not, but he'll start really ramping up the uh, uh, the language in regards to, uh, to Germany and German auto sector. And don't forget, again, uh, President Macron will be happy about this. You know, there's, there's a lot of people in Europe who, are, who would like for the Germans to really begin to suffer some type of uh, economic slowdown in order to get them off their uh, uh, view towards, you know, blocking fiscal stimulus. So don't think that they're not quietly rooting for that. And, and Macron, to me, likes to play with Trump to get Trump excited because he knows it'll have a lot more impact on Germany than it will on France because Germany's industrial sector is totally, you know, is so export-oriented. And uh, if he can impact it, he'll impact it. So these things are, these things are in play. There's, you know, so much of it is just, you know, political. But Macron is having a good time because he is—he would love for nothing more than Germany to go into a 
a pretty deep uh, recession. So that would really, really get them off this, you know, idea of you know austerity, 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 austerity. Uh, and of course, you know, he knows that will get the Italians behind him in a minute. So. I, and, I, and I'm thinking that Trump is really going to uh, to increase the rhetoric about tariffs on uh, on Europe. You, you know, he already because first of all, now he's hiding behind the idea that France is going to throw that uh, uh, tax on U.S. Uh, high tech companies. So now Trump says, you know, that he's going to throw a massive tariff on uh, French wines. But I I I, I think the Macron doesn't mind this thing. That's really not significant com compared to the importance of getting Germany into a situation where they're going to actually have to do something and maybe stop blocking the idea of fiscal stimulus and actually get on board and get behind themselves. Uh, that they're watching going forward, which is, again, is an incentive to do something with China. He, he needs those optics, but uh, I'm a I'm a little ahead of, of the game here, I think. But these are just things that I'm looking at that could play out here, and it can play out here ah, fairly quickly. Because you know, the, again, the election. You know, now that we're into the debates, and we got again debates tonight. Um, uh, there, there's not. Uh, who who's saying that time is on my side? Was that was that the Rolling Stones? Yeah. Um, time is not on a lot of people's side here. They may think it is. It's not. That window's closing, and it's closing fairly quickly. Yeah, but they got to change their tune because what they've been talking about isn't going to apply. Oh, yeah. It's which ones are we talking about? Because it's got a lot of blood. I mean, from Kamala to busing, which really oh, yeah. Because I had to take my daughter through a bus school for six years. It was the worst experience in the world. The kids yeah. were unruly. I mean, even even the kid, the public librarians were afraid of them. And, and the police wouldn't come in and do anything about it because they were, frankly, to, I was told, to my face by the officer that was in charge of the district that he was being paid to be at Parker every day after school and the rest of us could screw off. <laughs> Listen, I, 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 I grew up in the city. I went to city schools and I was involved in, I, I wasn't bus, but they were busing in from various parts of the city. And and my mother, who's as fine and as good a person as it was, was says, I wouldn't put you on a bus. It's it's not fair to the kids. It breaks down, you know, she was totally opposed to it for other reasons. And uh, we had uh, the first black kids bus in and, and it was fine, you know, it really, it, and a lot of them, you know, it worked out extremely well. Uh, some did very well, but didn't uh, take uh, full advantage of it because uh, Mel Reynolds, for those, he, he was, him and his brother, he had a twin brother. They were in the first bus, busing the entire school. And uh, it was, it was really good. <laughs> he fell foul, but I, I, like, I, I still like Mel. I used to play a lot of ball with him and see him a lot. Uh, but it, I, it's, it's a hard thing. And to make this an issue at this time, I, I think uh, it was grandstanding to a fault because we've moved beyond that. I mean, Chicago is just the schools are open. You know, back then the schools weren't open. You had to go to school in the neighborhood in which you lived. End of story. Unless you went to Lane Tech or CVS you know, or Lindblom. If you went to a technical school, you could go. But but that's the size of it. It's, uh, I just, yeah, I just think there are a lot of figure minds. Our kids are on one floor. And, you know, yeah, right. and that's it. Right, because that's what the people in the city have done. They've carved out all these schools for themselves, very niches, you know. So they have all the AP classes on one floor and everybody else sits there and goes, huh, what's going on here? I, I know. 
it, it, it's just a giant game. Yeah, CPS is it, it's it, the whole thing is just unbelievable. Yeah, it's been. Uh, so, I believe my my nieces. That's why we sent our yeah. schools. Yep. Yeah. It's, that's right. That's right. Listen, I I know that, and I knew that, and it, and it became much more uh, uh, prevalent in the seventies after I got I I graduated uh, high school in seventy one. So. But the hey, politics are, are are only going to get worse anyway. By the way, until uh, until somebody steps up uh, who's electable with the Democrats, and you could see that the discussion is at least taking place. The discussion of finding somebody good to run. Yeah, because I mean that was you know from what I didn't watch the uh, debate last night, but. Uh, but it is out there, you know, that, and these guys went after them on the attack. Uh, for that reason, you know, the more moderates, uh, what's the name, Hickenlooper, and uh, they, they were the, they were, they were the stalkers. They were going after them for that reason, you know, because they've got to get somebody out there who really resonates. And you know what? Unless Biden does something great today, which I, I just, and that's insignificant anyway. I think he's, his days are just past. Uh, just uh, important, you know, it's like, it, you know, Trump gave him a good acronym, Sleepy Joe, because, yeah. you, you, yeah. know, you know, when, when he's on, he's great, but he's just not on all the time. And you can't do that in a campaign. And you no. can't do that no. when, when you govern. Well, and again, one of the one of the things that bothers me about him is the same thing that bothers me about Al Gore. That bothered me about uh, for time served in Washington, they really haven't learned much, you know. Because the fact that that he has as many slip ups, well, I mean, what have you been doing? But true, you know, I've I, I I'm offended by it because I know what it takes, and you, and you guys hear me, and we engage how much energy and work it takes to stay up to speed. But he's, I don't have a research staff like he has a research staff. So I, I'm going, wow, the amount of work I could get done if I had a staff of 10 would be unbelievable. So what are you doing? <laughs> what, what, what exactly are you doing? You have so many missteps when it comes to, uh, discussion about policies and I, I, it's it's really uh, it is really one of the things that that truly uh, bothers me the most is that what have you been doing all you've been there forty years. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but we had this conversation too because at some point they go, well, you know, all these people that get in, it's not their job to govern anymore. Their job is they when they come in is to stay in office, make money, garner um, favors and political favors, yep. stay in office and get a huge and, and it's a career building for their bank account. It's not yeah, it. it's not altruistic governing. It's not what the founding fathers, you know, were thought you were supposed to be about. The last point No, they're not no, it's not even close. It's been so badly uh, perverted. It's just, it's just, it's just so bad. Um, and yeah, and it's all about raising money. As soon as they get in, you know what? I, I will not give to a to a candidate. I, I made the mistake, and all I'm doing is inundated with, uh, you know, because they they sell your name to everybody else. Right. I, I won't give them a dime. I, I just I can't. I you know I can't. It's just, they, they've ruined it for it. It's all, you know, and I write back to them. I said, you know, you're such, uh, you're horse. And, you know, and they get offended. Yeah, well, when, when, <laughs> when the Supreme Court threw out campaign finance, I mean, that was the worst thing they've ever done. 
I mean, at least they had a chance with campaign finance reform. And then they basically overturned it and said, okay, now you guys do whatever you want. Yeah, right. 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 That's, okay, but that's, that's, that's going to continue to play out here. There's no, no doubt about it. Um, so, yeah, you know. Uh, my family member said, that's it. You know, he, he got out of the yeah, He said, that's it. Yeah, that, so we spent the last six years getting this through. And these guys, uh, you know, just ruled for the Koch brothers. So what are we doing? Well, yep. Yeah. yeah, so we will return to the theme of central banks, because the central banks have attained a, a significant, in fact, there's an article somewhere today. Oh, it's on Project Syndicate, uh, and it's entitled, at the, oh, it was written by uh, uh, Raghuram uh, uh, Rajan, who may be the next central bank head of, he may be the head of the Bank of England. He was the head of the Reserve Bank of India, but he had a piece in Project Syndicate uh, talking about how the central banks have to own this now. That they uh, let's see what exactly was the headline. Uh, central banks are the fall guys. Yep, yeah, that's the one. Central banks are the fall guys, which and it was an interesting article because they placed themselves into this situation. So the politics are going to be the politics. I am really, you know, I, I am central bank oriented. It's going to be interesting today, uh, I, I, to say the least, and, and it's going to set the table for market volatility going into the end of the year. And, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm really looking forward to see what story it tells and how the markets are, how the markets are going to, to, to tell the story. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's especially because, you know, just how far ahead of themselves are, how far ahead is the, is the equity markets. And, and yesterday's sell off in the DAX was really, you know, I, I was trying to measure it. Was it because of the Euro sterling rally, you know, up to the almost up to the 9200 level? Is it the fear of Trump going after the Europeans, uh, especially the, you know, the Germans? Uh, so, you know, what is going on here? Uh, but something definitely was dramatic yesterday to drive the DAX down to that level, um, uh, uh, which makes it very, uh, you know, again, very important to watch because we are, we are in this dynamic place and it is dynamic. And yet, you know, it's like I did a, I haven't posted yet. I did a podcast yesterday with the uh, Financial Repression Authority. And uh, I was on with this woman who I didn't know from um, Bank Credit Analyst, which I used to have a lot of respect for. Uh, and it was interesting because she was much more status quo than I think about. But that's because they mine so much data and put out so many charts. And you can always hide behind that data. You know, you can always find something to make your case. Always. Always. That, that's the that's that's part of the sadness of the age of relativity that we're that we're living in and and pieces half or not even half pieces of information but tiny pieces of information that we have to piece together in order to see in order to see what's real just trying oh, yeah i yeah it's, it's absolutely true it's absolutely true because there's just so much out there and but i i will say this I think we've seen a slowdown in some of these algos because, uh, you know, to use like Soros's phrase, we haven't seen as much re reflexivity on a short term basis with certain things. And I'm beginning to think that some of the more uh, momentum fundamental driven traders are really having a bigger impact for the moment. And, you know, I, I've seen that in the gold silver until, t you know, now we're getting a little correction today, but the move was so sustained. Now, I know that the big part of it was, of course, was the unwinds because somebody had the position on mm -hmm. and drove it, but other things that were going on. So that excites me because I've been waiting for that. 
because I like, you know, any other fundamental analyst, you know, especially in the global macro discretionary world, I know that's a mouthful, uh, have, have been run over by these. And that's why I always like to see the fundamentals reassert themselves because they, listen, they, they have not been. And you've seen some of the greatest traders uh, from Tudor to Caxton to uh, Druckenmiller, they've all been trying to uh, measure and refocus themselves how to trade in this world. Even they, they're, they're, all, they're always um, adjusting, which is the great thing about trading because it's, again, too many people exist in a static mindset when when this is such a dynamic arena yeah right is it the fundamentals is it free money that's that that's keeping this market up where would the market what what i th what the uh uh the most interesting piece of today that i think is going to be that's going to be uh meaningful to me and that i'm going to do some 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 reading on is whether or not they're going to end quantitative t tightening today yeah it's I think important. That's, it is important. And, and then, then I, you know, so if they end quantitative tightening, how much is that going to, to, to take, how much fundamentally will the market start moving, you know, in a, in a fundamental way again, as opposed to just the, the algos and HFTs and other bots moving it around at their leisure and, and, and with no regard for fair, fair value and for what the market should be telling us. Yeah, no, it's, Again, we, we we don't have that, but we're going to find out. We, we we are going to find out. And again, the bond markets, which used to be my favorite to watch as any type of indicator, they're not. They're not an indicator really of anything. Not risk on, not risk off. They're, they're, they are totally owned. Um, what was that word that uh, Rajan used? Um, uh, they makes the central banks totally account accountable for all this in the world. And, and we go back again to, 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 uh, to BlackRock, you know, having the audacity to say that they should be buying stocks. Jeez, no, they should all be stepping back and taking a breath and seeing and giving it this time. And I always thought that Jay Powell was on that path, but he could, he just couldn't take the heat from the, from the, uh, from the, from the sell off back in uh, December. Uh, you know, actually, for the last quarter of 2018, it just got too much for them. Which would have let the market, which would have let market forces correct itself, as it would have. Well, yeah, what away. a novel idea! What right. a novel idea that would be. Yeah, I <laughs> know no, it's pathetic. But that brings us back to to what you were just saying: is is it's fun to watch fundamentals come back into play again, and the algos to quiet down. Right. You know, absolutely it is. Absolutely it is. It's very important. F f fundamentals come back and and drive the show, Matt. Seriously, and ha and have the <laughs> and, and have the elites suffer pain. Yeah. How about that? Uh, yes. Yeah. That, and that's that. That's the. That would be one of the 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 uh, um, conclusions of that simple Aristotelian logical uh argument wouldn't it is that that would it would cause pain for the for the elites for the east coast elites yeah if you believe that i have a bridge in lower manhattan that i'd like to sell you that i don't own <laughs> well, let me and see if thought, I, yeah that's okay yeah let me see if i can raise the the leveraged funds that i don't have that i don't own to buy it okay, do, do it do it with uh do it using some clos you know and then and then you put a toll booth on the bridge pedestrian and car. <laughs> Oh, oh, you mean like Chicago? Chicago with the parking meters? Oh, yeah, yeah that's an easy game. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, no, no, it, but it, but that's right. And 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 I, and again, as my friend Kevin talks about, that the the elites never got discredited; they got rewarded. Unlike in 1932 under Roosevelt, when the elites under the Pecora Commission really suffered, and the bankers really suffered. There was no suffering; here. they got rewarded. And, and let's let, let's raise the minimum wage to twenty five bucks an hour in order to solve income inequality. <laughs> right, right. Wipe out uh, really harm you know, small businesses. If, but, if, but that's why. 
Lizzie Warren resonates. You know, she's not, she does get that right. She just has I mean, to venture yeah, far further afield. But if, if $15, if, if 15 bucks is the magic number, why not make it a hundred bucks an hour? You know, if, if, if that's the solution, make everybody no rich. Yeah. Okay. Or, or better yet, you know, give everybody a million bucks a year. Hey, you know, yeah. I, I, Ira, you know what I can't understand? How come nobody, nobody stands up and says it's not the government's place to decide what an entry level worker with no skills should be paid? Nobody says that. Well, All they do is talk about, oh, jobs, jobs, jobs. Well, there are people. Well, there are people talk about it. They're just not the people you say, you know, because again. Uh, should you know and and this is a not the place for for these philosophical arguments you know of uh you know free market capitalism versus cuz that doesn't exist either we see a lot of crony capitalism and that makes the attack on the whole thing resonate more because everybody can see it you know okay yeah yeah i got it i know what you're doing i see what you're doing blah 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 and and it does give credence and look at let, let's go back to the conversations here that we talk about that the elites didn't get punished enough. Well, you're feeling the same thing that they are. You're just stated in a much more sophisticated manner, but it, it does call the question. It, it's one of my serious issues with the central banks is they, because they don't allow markets to work, they, they uh, ab uh, abort the true effects of capitalism. And I'm not saying that, it, that it's easy in any way, shape, or form. And again, we'll go back to Ben Bernanke's uh, work on the, you know, as, I, as I've called him for years, he's a 37er. In fact, I, it's amazing in the land of political correctness called Washington, D.C., that they still have the Washington Redskins, which ought to be named, the, to me, the Washington 37ers, because I will do everything to prevent the type of economic calamity that took place in 1937 when uh, the, uh, when the U.S. government raised taxes because the economy was starting to get better and to balance the budget, and as well as the Fed raising interest rates. You know that's that's what Bernanke because that caused the true you know another bout of serious deflation. And I, I I wish these idiots on TV again would stop talking about inflation and its impact. When everything, it's the opposite side of the coin that's true, is that everything the Fed and all these central banks do is because they're fair. They live in the fear of a deflationary spiral. Everything Bernanke did was to prevent a deflationary spiral. And we're living with the effects of it. And that continues to be the modus operandi of all the central banks. Seems like they're working. Uh, they're they're working more and more in continuum with one another, and, and you know, in, in conjunction. Oh, they are. There's. I, I swear, every speech is the same. I'm not making that up. Go go and look at their speeches that they give. They're all the same. I go. Do they have one speechwriter? What 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 are they? What is this? A 3D printer just spinning out? Because it's all the same. They use the same words. Uh, it's all the same, and that's and that's Bernanke's legacy, by the way. You know, I'm, I'm just I'm just not there with him. You know, it irritates the, the hell out of me to tell you the truth. Um, everything that he did. Oh, I'm yeah, C central um, banks, central banks trying to smooth economic gravity, then incentivize as a result excessive debt. Excessive debt creates fear of deflation, so therefore we have to inflate, right? It, it, it's it, it's this um, what kind of cycle? What's the word I'm looking for? Um, it's a, it's a feedback loop. A, feed, a, a feedback loop of bad behavior. It is it's a negative feedback loop. But you know this was warned about uh, by you know again I I cite them because I think and I'm not trying to be pedantic, but the the economist who best diaried the depression was Joseph Schumpeter. And he warned of all of this. He, he, he understood, 
and this is, and he was really worried about them just destroying uh, capitalism because for capitalism for him was entrepreneurship. He was a big believer in entrepreneurs and their ability to create jobs and everything with it. And that's you know the concept. It was him who coined the phrase of creative destruction. What was because the that's what uh, Schumpeter. Thanks, I got it. Taught, taught at Harvard. He was a very dapper guy. He's an interesting guy. And and the Economist magazine years ago named him the top economist of the last hundred years. But he discussed this, and he and he, and he discussed it so beautifully because he had the concept of pushing on a string. At least that was the first place that I read it, and it made so much sense. Because again, banks, and this is what the Fed relies upon. Draghi talks about symmetry, but it's but central banking is really an asymmetric endeavor, and that's what Paul Volcker taught us, because they can stop inflation by raising interest rates and tightening money. They could they could bring an economy to its to its knees, as we saw uh, under the Volcker uh, regime, in order to squeeze out inflation. But he wrote back then, you you cannot get an entrepreneur, you cannot get businesses to borrow if they can't see a real return on capital. So even if interest rates are zero and you can't get a, a strong enough return, business people are not going to borrow. And, th- and that was what was deemed pushing on a string. And that's the world in which we live in. <clears throat> you know, they all wonder, well, why aren't businesses borrowing? Well, if I don't think I can make an adequate return, but of course, the only place to make an adequate return is to borrow capital and then go overseas and start opening businesses because their labor is cheap enough that the money you borrowed. And then if you can you know, export it into your country, you can, you can earn a, a, a high enough return, which is why up until this year, you know, corporate profits were at all time highs. But but the economic activity, meaning the manufacturing aspect of it, was taking place in China. But, see, and that's why the first move, and you just heard Trump t- throw this out there. I don't know whether he did or somebody in that meeting that, uh, you know, that took place about a dollar depreciation is that was capital controls. I'm telling you, if you saw a capital control in any advanced uh, country, any developed economy, start selling the equity markets. That is as anathema to to this whole thing as anything. Because if you put on capital controls, it's not going to. I mean, the fact that it makes it into the discussion, I, somebody was a lunatic, but that would shut this all down. Corporate profits would would disappear. And believe me, I, I'm throwing that out there. It just that would be the ultimate negative thing for equity markets. I don't care where you took interest rates, but that was the whole concept of, of you know interest rates at zero. Again, the Fed and other people are always in the in the business of making the decision of who's going to get screwed. That's the work of Carmen Reinhardt, who wrote who wrote off on her work with financial uh, repression. But that's the same with taxation. It's always making the decision of who is going to get screwed. Take a look at the email I just sent you. I don't want to put that out to the public. Okay. Well, you're not Nordstrom. So I'll get rid of that. You're not verbal. I'll get rid of that. Oh, here it is. Let me see. I have to I have to go through all my oh I can't watch a video, <laughs> sorry I can't do that I'll I'll get to it later, uh, I don't want my computer to melt, um, but these these are the serious issues that are, that are truly confronting all of us and are lock stock in, fr- in front of us but it's all a determination. Tax policy is the policy of who's going to get screwed is Russell Long, and it is the the Senate. Uh, office building is called the Long Building. You know, it, it's Russell Long 
in the fifties cited this, you know, he had a little ditty. Don't tax him and don't tax me. Tax the man behind the tree. Because you're always looking to see who's going to pay the price. <laughs> who's going to pay the price. And, and that's, you know, again, economics is the study of the creation of wealth. Politics is the study of the distribution of wealth. And if you think of it in that term, things really begin to make a lot of sense when you look at the policy. That's why I study political economy, because I can't divorce one from the other. I don't care. The data are the data. Okay, I get that. And I understand in a, in a pristine world how that's going to affect potentially interest rate policy is set by the government. But ultimately, look at taking interest rates to zero was done to try to get people to spend money. If you're a saver, to take your savings out and spend it to get velocity to your money. That's what zero interest rates were about. And it punished savers. Well, if, I, if, I, if you're not paying me for anything we're saving, I'm not going to save. And Bernanke openly admitted that in Jackson Hole in 2010 when he used the phrase portfolio balance channel. So the fact that you weren't getting anything on your savings was forcing you in the spirit of John Maynard Keynes to embark upon animal spirits. Now that can be investing in the stock market, but it can also be entrepreneurial actions, what Keynes called it, the animal spirits where him and Schumpeter agreed on a lot of things. Uh, and that was to motivate that. And he called it the portfolio balance channel, moving away from savings and bank accounts into the equity market. And it was by design. I understood it. Shame on me for not being long. I, I, I did begin to, in 2011 to buy more stock than I had ever owned in my life because it's just never been my, I mean, I could buy S&Ps and, and trade all day long, but to be a longer term investor, I always felt I took enough risk in everything that I do in my life as, as a living that I didn't want to put everything I ever made at risk every day. But that's what the objective was. It was to punish savers and on the flip side to reward borrowers because the lower you, you the lower you pushed uh, interest rates, the lower borrowing costs went and you were bailing out those who carried a lot of debt. And if you think of it in that terms, really things, things are easy to understand. And you just have to admit that's what's going on. It, and it's really the same with taxation. The, the struggle over taxes is to always figure out Who's going to bear the brunt? And unfortunately, it's always been the middle class, which is why we have a tax code filled with loopholes. Because one's the headlines, the other's the effective rate that actually begins to take place. Thanks, Eric. Yeah. Great. And so the story unfolds. Well, it, it, and that's not that's that's an apolitical statement, by the way, because they're all guilty of it. And it, it's not Democrats, but it's not because they all go ahead when there's listen. The Democrats have run this country, uh, especially in, in congressional, you know, where led, where tax legislation really uh, gets made uh, far more than the Republicans have. But and they all have their favorites and they all pick their favorites and who's going to, you know. That's that's what goes on. What, why do you think? You, I've always said you don't need tax. Or, you, you don't need campaign re finance reform. You just need tax reform, because if you wipe out these loopholes, campaign donations would dry up, except for those who are really you know involved with a, with an issue. But if you if you did uh, tax reform. You wouldn't have to worry about campaign finance reform because a lot of these big donors, bye bye. Oh yeah, and 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 they all know what's going on <clears throat> here for it if they've got a good pack guy because they all go to dinner five times a night or five days a week at at ten ten thousand plus a head, and they all sit down and they I... all talk about what's going to get done. <sighs> I'm going to tell you what, the most honest guy to listen to is, is Alan Simpson. 
And it's really my big beef with Obama. I, I have other issues with him, but he put together that uh, Bowl Simpson, yeah, was which was a buy. Had he had he seen that? He walked away from it as fast as he could because a lot of Democrats were opposed to it. But that was the beginning of real tax reform in this country, and it was a bipartisan effort. Uh, uh, and it had real. I mean, I read this. I read it. I read it twice. But it it stepped on too many toes, and they couldn't run away from it fast enough because a lot of them were big donors. Yeah, and it made sense. It made it was yeah, it did. Reform, and they all it did rejected it because well, it, Ob yeah. Obama could have pushed on it, but he didn't have the leadership. He, he he, you know what? When it came to economics and Wall Street, I think he was he just was not knowledgeable enough, and he was easily intimidated by the money. That that's. I don't know that to be a fact, but that's that's my sense. He, and which is why he he had to swallow guys like Tim Dyke, Tim Tim Geithner, and Larry Summers, because he he didn't feel comfortable enough challenging uh, certain aspects. And and Alan Simpson became an ally of his if he would have understood what was taking place. And Erskine Bowles was great. I have a lot of respect for Erskine Bowles, and it was a really nice bipartisan effort. But just did not have the uh, the intestinal fortitude to see it through. And it, and it, and it cost us, you know what? And it, and it allowed Trump, you know, the Trump tax reform. Hey, please, you know, yes, I, I know corporate, and I'm in favor of corporate taxes going down. But they they didn't close any of the loopholes that they needed, except that he punished. <laughs> people in, in blue states who pay a lot of money in real estate taxes, who could, you know, those people got punished. But, uh, and, I, and I'm not making a statement about that because some ways, yeah, okay, I get it. But uh, outside of that, they, did, they didn't do anything. They, they didn't really affect anything. He cut, cut taxes and we, we saw a lot of stuff brought forward, but all that's happened, and, and I am a deficit hawk. So, uh, you know, I make no, I voted for Ross Perot twice because I'm a deficit hawk. That was, you know, Ross Perot had it, had it right. He just, you know, he was, I'm, it's hard to run as an independent, but the first time he got 20.7% of the, of the popular vote, which was unbelievable. But a lot of people felt that way. I'm a deficit hawk. That doesn't mean I don't believe in, 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 in certain programs. I just want things that pay for themselves because I know the bill is going to come due and my children, and it's just irresponsible, but I'm a deficit on. And, and my first place, which is what I loved about the bowl Simpson, and because Alan Simpson agrees with this was to cut defense spending by 10% because it's the politics of defense spending that makes everything else fall into place. Cause everybody wants a defense plan. I'll show my, uh, my real radical roots, not many people know about political roots, as folks, you know, uh, hey, everybody wants a defend, defense plant in their district. So once you start dispensing that defense money around the country, then everything else gets negotiated. So to me, if you cut defense, you can go a long way towards correcting a lot of the budget. And it's not that I don't believe in a military, I do, but there's just ridiculous the amount of money that they spend on defense is ridiculous you can cut 10 percent and not lose a thing well, i think it, it, I, I think it's beyond ridiculous we, we, we yeah and, but it, but it's 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 like beyond me but it's beyond ridiculous because it just makes all that other spending fall into line and I, I, I've studied this for when I was in university. It was a very serious issue for me um, in looking at the defense budget and what it means. So th that's a real problem. And and if the and the Democrats, you know, they lose me too because you know they talk that game until it comes, you know, uh, to losing defense jobs in their in their district. And all of a sudden they get they go all wobbly. Well, it's all about who they're getting paid. Bye. Yeah.
Yeah, it's all, always is. I mean, when uh, you know, I did a little tour in '91 and '92 yep. with my brother. I mean, it, it was like, okay, this is how it really works. And then when you see how it really works, it's disgusting. It's just like the skylight guy that left. The skylight's eight hundred dollars. Yep. The the labor for these guys to come over is two hundred percent more. You, you know what? Yeah, it's, yeah, that's right. And people, unfortunately, in fact, I have it. I have it sitting in front of me. My eighth grade concert. I have it because we're cleaning out the house. I have my eighth grade Constitution study guide because in the Chicago Public Schools you had to take a Constitution test in order to to move on to high school. I don't know if they still do it or not. Yeah, uh, they still, yeah they do. But it's it's a very intense. Yeah, I still have. I have it right here, right in front of me, because uh, we found. I don't know where we found it, but. Uh, it's actually quite good. Um, there's only 24 amendments. So, uh, so, so uh, it is, it, it's, it's, it, it's fascinating the way that this plays out, but it really does real harm. Um, does a lot of harm. And again, I am, I am a, a budget hawk uh, and I am, and I know where the problem begins and you have to be honest, but it really takes, about a leadership who said, you know, somebody to say, hey, I don't care about being reelected. Here's what's going to happen. And, it's, and it is one of the things that really irks me, you know, when, when Trump talks about, oh, how great the economy is. I'm just not there because I see a trillion plus deficit with a, you know, with a GDP of let's say two and a half percent. That's unconscionable. That's unconscionable. And there will be a price to pay, yeah, which is why I am not wildly bullish a dollar. Uh, Cause I, I always believe that debt is going to rise to be an issue far faster than a lot of people want to believe. I don't think there's any escaping it. No. And, and Santelli's hit today with Rogoff really got into that. Cause, and, and I'm not a great fan of Rogoff. I have a lot of, and I read a lot of his things, but on this one, and he said, the, the bill is going to come through and this is going to be the political discussion of the twenties of the next decade, because interest rates aren't going to stay here forever. They're just not. And when they go higher, the debt load and the financing of that debt load is going to be so great that uh, a lot of discretionary programs are going to be cut. And then you're really going to get into the deep discussions. Rogoff, Rogoff is a definition of a swamp creature, isn't he? Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, he was the chief economist for the IMF, you know, you know, Harvard, you know, it's, he's got it all. He's an extremely bright guy, but that doesn't mean I have to agree with him. There are a lot of bright people out there, but they get on certain things. Listen, he wrote that book, uh, This Time It's Different, with Carmen Reinhart. And I, I think Carmen Reinhart, I like her work much more. I, I do. I just, you know, from an academic perspective, it may not be as good, but from a, 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 somebody who's in the markets and and tries to analyze things in that vein. I think she's she's great, and she writes beautifully, and she speaks beautifully. I went, I've actually gone to see her speak uh, a couple times, but one time it was fa was fabulous. Uh, but and now we're going to wait for the Fed. But these things are on the table. These things will not go away. But again, you can't trade these things right now. We know that they're out there. But if I but I will say this: if I did see the phrase that the White House was mulling foreign exchange controls, I would, I would uh, that I know what to do with. I, I would be long bonds and short the S&Ps. That's what I know right away. You want to see that spread reverse? That, that would be a, a massive move because that would be about as dumb as you can get. Old-fashioned flight to quality. Yeah, well, it would be the end of the free flow of capital around the world. So we can take that apart and do the math with that. And, and 
that that would be a dynamic change. A very dynamic change, by the way. A very dynamic change. But that leaked out. I, I don't even know what that meeting was about when it was that last Thursday, supposedly. And then and then Cudlow had to come out and head it off. <laughs> I, 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 sometimes I feel bad for, for him when I see him. Oh, yeah. Some, yeah he's, no, no, because he knowingly. Yeah. So, you right. know, again. You're right. You know, it's like the damn. It's like Jerry Lewis and the damn Yankees. You know, he sold his soul. Yeah. Or, uh... Earlier, we were talking about Rogoff uh, in in our room, and and somehow talking about Rogoff kind of led us into a discussion about Joey the Clown Lombardo. I don't know how the two are related. But... <laughs> I'm off. I'm t- stop tape. Stop tape. <laughs> stop tape. We're not. What are you? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how the two are related, but we got there. I don't know how I, how I. You know I, what? He's got far more integrity than those guys. I know that. Right. I know. <laughs> that, that I'm sure. That's uh, you know that that I'm sure of. And, and I I think I've told you this that when I when I read Neil Borowski's book, who was the uh, uh, Inspector General for for TARP, he wrote a book after he. Uh, resigned his post, uh, and, and he's an interesting guy. But and I'm going to leave you with this because as long as you've gone that route, now here's the guy, Neil Borowski, and it's a great book. It's called. Uh, it's easy to find. It's I think he, he wrote a book about tarp and its impact and what he saw and the whole thing. And uh, here's what he, he he's got a great line in there. Now, before he took that job, you know, and I gave Obama a lot of credit for appointing him because that was not an easy appointment. This is a tough, he was a tough guy from a legal perspective. And he worked in the Southern District of Manhattan uh, prosecuting the Medellin cartel. Okay, the Medellin cartel. How would you like to go to bed at night with that as your job? No, no thanks. No gracias. No gracias. So, so this is a guy who's been there. And his comment was about dealing with Washington because he, he wasn't a Washington guy, but his, he had such great integrity. And he, I think he was a Republican in, in Obama or, or he was a Democrat in Bush. Whatever. Interesting guy. And he had this to say. He felt safer in, uh, in, uh, in Bogota than he did in Washington, D.C., because he said at least when you dealt with the meeting car- cartel, they would kill you and you would see it coming. In Washington, everybody just stabs you in the back and you never see it. So it was quite a statement. Great line. It was it was a phenomenal line. I loved it. I, I, I just totally loved it. Because it's it's so telling about the whole atmosphere. That's another book I'm going to have to find out. Yeah, I let's see if I think I have it in Arizona. I don't have it here because uh, I I used to give it to people to read. Uh, Neil Borowski, and, and I'll tell you a sidelight to that, okay? Because the way this really works, and I don't care that I'm being recorded on this. Um, so after he wrote the book, you know, as they do with all these books, they put you on the tour. So you go out and you talk about. It. So you'll see whoever wrote a book winds up on Bloomberg, they wind up on CNBC. They, that's just what, the way it gets done because that's the way the PR departments work. So one morning, they're going to have them on. And I had read the book, so I said I was interested in what? In, in, so they had, and you can go look this up. I, what I'm telling you is factual. And you can, uh, for many reasons. So I see they're having Borowski on. And who's interviewing him? Steve Leisman. <laughs> now, Steve Leisman is asking him questions. And I'm going, wait a minute. I read the book. Ooh, ooh, these are inane. So finally, finally, during the interview, Borowski says to Leisman, you haven't even read the book, have you? It was such a hatchet job. And the Columbia School of Journalism has an ethics 
uh, spot where they will call out what they think. They cited Leesman on that for unethical because it was such a hatchet job. It's like he was sent there to try to undermine and embarrass Borowski. But Borowski is such a seasoned – this is a guy who's a seasoned prosecutor. He, he saw it, and he said it. And he said and he was, and he never came on CNBC again after that. Ever, he would go to Bloomberg when they would, but he never went on CNBC. It's one of the things I, I why I have disdain for one of the reasons I have disdain because that was despicable. And I watched it, and the fact that I had read the book, I was very cognizant of the discussion in its entirety. And I said, "These are this is crazy." And finally, Borowski turned to him and said, "You haven't even read the book." And that was the end. That was the end of the interview. Oh. And I'll, I'm going to leave this. It must be that they, they've got nothing out of China because the grains are getting hit pretty good here. So yeah, there was I'm going to say that. Discussions to continue in September. High level okay. in Washington. Okay. So nothing immediate. So, yeah, yeah, you know, it's again, that's why the beans were – not doing anything with them. I wanted to see the way they acted. If they started to move up and rally, I said, well, something's positive. Evidently not. Cause it, Ira, a, I, I, don't, I don't think, I don't think the Chinese um, need a trade deal for the purchase of the grains. They'll probably, they'll, they'll just buy them when they need them. I, I, I agree with that, but it would have, it would have helped the, uh, the optics of it. <laughs> I don't, I don't think they care. Oh, no, no, not, not that they care. I'm talking about it. for the farmers. It would have helped the oh. optics of it. You know, because, again, and this is my problem with, with Wilbur Ross in the way that they did this with putting the tariffs on the Chinese, which, which directly led to the soybean uh, import fees for the Chinese, to the Chinese, was that they did it right when the Brazilian harvest was coming in and the bins were full and there was an alternative. And what's happened not only have farmers taken a hit, the 40 years of goodwill. Let's think of it in terms of what Wilbur Ross could possibly understand, which is buyouts. You know, when you buy a company and you spend, uh, if it's an $80 billion buyout and $10 billion is goodwill, which gets written down over the years, you understand what goodwill is. So all the efforts you did to build this up have been destroyed. You you spent 40 years building a market up for American farmers. And now you've chased them to your to your biggest competitor. Well, what's what's the goodwill loss in that? I would say well, I I don't have a a, a true calculation, but it's in the tens if not maybe 100 billion dollars cuz there's been a lot of energy put into developing those markets. Now you just blew them. Now you just boom because you were able to force them to an alternative supplier. Can Brazil replace U.S. production? South America? They have. They they have. Yeah. Brazil's huge. It was a a gift delivered to the Brazilian economy. It was a gift. By the way, you know, Russia's an exporter of grains now. That's something that's off the huge yeah yeah you know and that historically is you know been the ukraine and russia the steppes region used to be the breadbasket of the world believe it or not yeah but during the communist period they certainly weren't until yeah until Stalin slaughtered the kulaks and and uh expropriated all their property uh but that was the breadbasket of the world (laughs) and they're back to export not a grain but they're you know, it's been hot in Europe this year, so that crops, which is why I thought that they would, you know, in my, my thesis is, is that, but it's, <clears throat> it's not bearing out. Um, I mean, after, I haven't been out driving around, but the weather has been ideal. It, whoever got crop in the ground is getting a crop because, you know, you've had, you've had some rain from the, uh, the hurricane that came up and the weather – we had a couple we, a couple of days of intense heat, but we really have not had a hot, an overly hot summer. Ira, what what I think will be interesting is to see, um, you know, how much pork, uh, and and possibly chicken, you know, China mm-hmm. might have to might have to import. I mean, there's I yep. mean, American chicken is banned there 
as it is, right? Um, well, they they were they produced so much, but that was you know the soy meal that was going to feed those chickens. Yeah, and and I think soybeans feed uh, feed the uh, the pigs as well, right? Yeah, yeah, the hogs. Yeah, meal. You the hogs. Up, you, yeah. You know, so so if um, this African swine flu thing is is worse than what's reported, and that more of the herd gets uh, culled, mm-hmm. they're going to have to. They're going to need uh, you know animal protein. They're going to need imports of animal protein. Well, yeah, the, the whole animal, but not the grain. So you'll feed them here. Because, yeah. You know, that that's one of the reasons that the grain is, you know, the, the meal has been weak because of the culling of the herd. You know, the Chinese just don't need, although it, it they did buy all that sorghum. So that was kind of interesting a couple of weeks ago. That's real. They actually... Uh, they took a huge shipment of, sh- of sorghum, which I thought was going to open up to more. But I, I think these headlines, if there are headlines right now, uh, the fact that they didn't, you know, get anywhere. I got to be honest. Uh, I don't even know what sorghum is. It's a feed grain. It's also used in ethanol. Uh, it's not grown everywhere. Texas in the Panhandle, I believe they grow a lot of sorghum. Uh, Illinois has some. Uh, and it, and it's a good crop to rotate, you know, because in order to have efficient agriculture, you have to rotate crops. But but you, it is a it's it's a rich source of nutrients nutrients for uh, feed. Hmm. Okay. Well, Ira, thanks for stopping in. Uh, All right, let's let's see what the Fed does. Uh, oh, you know, yeah. Uh, what else? Uh, not to, Let's see not who the winners and losers are today. And I, I'm just, you know, you guys know, I'm checking out until, you know, I'll be. Out. Yeah, Pat, I'll be around. So if you if you if you want to get to me and we got something good, uh, just you know, you know how to get to me. You know, you know about how to get to me better than I know how to get to me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will, Ira. I will. <laughs> and and, to, and tomorrow I'm having lunch with Johnny at uh, <laughs> and Manny's. I'm buying them lunch and Manny's. Oh gosh! Yeah, one of my that's my that's one of my favorite all time places in Chicago to eat. Yeah, with the Nazi. I might go. Come I on might over. Have, yeah, I took Peter in there. Oh, it was funny. I'll never forget. Oh, the sandwich Nazi. You know he's Italian. That guy. I, I oh, my whole awesome. life I thought he was Jewish. My whole life I thought he was Jewish. <laughs> Where at, at Manny's? Yeah. You know what? Let me let me tell you. So I the, eating that food. Yeah. As I say, it killed more Jews than Hitler. Yeah. That food. Um, and that, and that, and yeah, you so, you can join Alfie in there. The Latkes are un. What do you mean, Alfie? They are. Oh, the Latkes. Oh, the Latkes. You are right. Evil. That's worth going there for with the applesauce. I'm a big oh, fan of that. It really is just the Latkes. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, you're right. I the corned beef. I can't. I can't eat, but. Oh, my uh, God. But the latkes are, are worth it. They, they, no question about it. No question about it. And they make good soup. They have great soup. Soup and latkes. That's yeah. right. Every yeah. so often, I'll get a, a, a oh, pack. Beer. That's it. Come on, come on over. I'll, 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 I'll go 